So the vendor warrant was 88,000 for 87 and 80 cents. Payroll warrant is 108, 811 and 81 cents. The payroll deduction warrant is 27, 301 and 30 cents. And the student activity fund is 988.19. And so those expenditures that we are approving and we have voted on it unanimously. Okay, meetings attended by select board members. So Erica, how about you? Um, none yet. I mean, I'm, I'm the liaison to the age-friendly um, communities uh, committee, but um, we have not met yet. Great. Uh, how about uh, Phil, how about you? Um, actually, for the first time like this year, I went two weeks without a, a governmental meeting. It was been lovely. Oh, I hope you enjoyed it. Well, it yes. Was, it was a crazy week with the election, and uh, it was probably nice to have the time off. Yeah. Um, well, I had a, we had a conservation commission meeting and we had a, uh, we, and we've been working with Comcast. We did not have a meeting of the cable advisory committee, but we've been working with Comcast. And what I can tell you is that we made an offer to Comcast and they have accepted it. So that is great news for the cable advisory committee. And um, we're having a meeting of the cable advisory committee tomorrow to present the offer to the Cable Advisory Committee. You know, in other words, our lawyer has been negotiating on our behalf, and it's now time to update the rest of the Cable Advisory Committee with the deal that we have arrived at, and I hope they will vote to accept it. And then eventually we'll be presenting it to the select board, uh, and, and I hope that we as the select board choose to accept it. But I don't know, Bob, sounds like it wasn't enough. <laughs> it's never enough. And, and, and the things that you want us to argue about are not legal. I mean, you know, the, we can't talk about programming and we can't talk about price. So what's left after that? And mostly it all has to do with, with uh, the community access television station. So that's what we've been talking about all this time. For a year, we've been talking about the, the community access television station. Okay, public comment. I, I see Jan is there from the public, but I'm not sure she's here to make a comment about a public comment. So we'll be back to Jan soon. So old business. So two weeks ago, we talked about a piece of land that's for sale that we have looked at longingly for, for flood mitigation, uh, for the next time we have serious flooding or especially, you know, with the South River and, uh, and we, we talked about a bunch of things that were going to happen before this week. Um, and one of them was, was Tom was going to, um, was, was going to negotiate a contract with somebody to appraise that land, um, which is, sort of the major step that we have to do to get this started. So Tom has sent us an appraisal contract uh, with, with Kitchell Lee uh, for $1,300 to get an appraisal. And uh, I assume everybody looked at it. Mm -hmm. Did it seem okay? The, the appraisal itself, the agreement is just fine. The question as to whether or not um, it's a wise thing to go forward with at this moment, um, I, I think should be discussed rather than just skipped over. So, so is this something you want to discuss, or do you do it have to be <laughs> um, um, I, in executive session, or um, you know? So, so I, 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 I tr okay, well, I try to do as much as we can here, just because I've already spoken to the seller. That, you know, and corresponded with him as well. So th there's nothing, there's no purpose in uh, whatever in, in executive session, I would think. Um, but the, so, you know, so, so, so you know, I, I did communicate with the seller um, and we just explored a lot of different options. I asked him, I asked him for about making a gift 
um, because he is in fact very community minded and a, he's a big supporter of Habitat for Humanity, for instance. Um, and, um, you know, but the, the, the long and the short of it is that they have already received what they feel is substantial in, uh, interest in the property at its listed price. And um, when I explained how much of a true pain in the butt it is to deal with the town, just from the, the honest arm's length transaction point of view of like the town being the purchaser uh, of real estate, uh, you know, and, and how the, we need to do the appraisal in the 20, section 21, uh, chapter 21 E um, a, 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 a report. And that then, then it would be in a, a sales agreement subject to town meeting approval, which must be given by two thirds. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when, when you stack that up versus somebody willing to shake hands and write a check for that straight amount, like on the spot, um, uh, you know, the, the long and the short of it is that, you know, he, the, this, the seller expressed an interest to just stay the course right now for now um, with the, w the way it is now listed. And he feels that, that they feel that they're going to be selling it in short order at the price that they asked for. Um, and if it's if it doesn't, you know, if spring comes and goes and it doesn't sell, then they would entertain um, you know, dealing with the town on, on this level. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a question, you know, uh, I, I, I like the idea. The well, other thing, the, the, you know, the, the other thing too, is that you're talking about $169,000. And yes, we've, we've identified um, the $90,000 from one fund so that it would not affect the, the assessment up to that amount. And then courtesy of Jack Lockhead, um, we believe there's another fund of, of about $20,000. Um, it's just, he remembers the creation of it at an older town meeting. Um, and, and that the, the, uh, so that gets us to 110,000. And the, 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 the weird thing right now is that the private landowner cannot subdivide. Like what would make the most sense would be to subdivide at the river and have the, the little house portion be able to be a separate lot from the, the, the main part of the lot, the, the three plus acres that the town wants for flood control, flood mitigation, et cetera, um, and river restoration. And so, you know, to me, the question is, you know, how, how feasible, it, because if, if the town could acquire it, and then if the town could subdivide, could, could do a variance for itself of its own rules and subdivide and sell that, sell the housing unit part, but that would require extending the grandfather, a separate variance for extending the grandfathering of the, the location of, of the residence, which only lasts for two years after it stops being a residence and they're already coming up on that. So that's like a double two-step uh, whatever. And so, so it's, it's, if, if you're talking about substantial outlays of money at town meeting, otherwise, um, the, even if it's like fifty thousand dollars, I, I wonder um, whether they would go for that. And the the other thing is that um, it just it just seems like the, it's going to sell before we're going to get a chance to have a crack at it. That, but, um, but if we don't do the appraisal, I, I I mean, two weeks ago we didn't talk like money was the biggest hurdle. Yeah, you know, I mean, we basically said it's a piece of land that we would be that would be excellent for the town, and that there was a bunch of sources of money and a lot of options. Uh, yeah, I mean, we might choose to put town offices on that, you know, that building site. Um, you know, not try to subdivide it. Uh, yeah, I don't know, and I mean, I'd be in. I think it's worth thirteen hundred dollars to to get the appraisal done and and if the appraisal comes out high enough we could make an offer and the the other part of it too is that i, I just don't want to lie down phil you know I did, yeah, yeah i, I get it. i i did not realize that there would be a that there would be opposition to the whole concept of the town doing anything with real estate whatsoever and especially with this that um you know that that now, you know, I was, I was approached by our fire chief who was, a, who, who was approached by our police chief and, um, 
and, and there's a whole belief that it doesn't really matter what we would do with flood mitigation in that area that we're still, what they say that the amount that what causes the flooding is the amount of water that can go under the bridges on Academy Hill Road in front of Town Hall and then on one scene that the, the amount of water that can go under those bridges is limited. And once that gets exceeded, it doesn't matter what channels you shoot, you, you go through, but once that is, it gets exceeded, then it floods. And that there yeah, is I, a, I think that, a, that that's actually um, only part of it. The, the main reason to do it, as far as I know, is to reduce the force of the river as it comes to the bank um, so that it does less damage. It's, it's not saying, you know, things aren't going to flood. It, it's actually flood effect mitigation would, would be a, a better way of putting it. I, I think that's the reason for doing it. Nobody expects that it wouldn't flood. All the studies that were done, you know, 20 years ago and over, over time all showed this was by far the best thing we could do. Yeah, it's been a priority, you know, identified for work on the South River for certainly as long as I've been here and sometime before, I think. So, I mean, and then, and then you know, the, it doesn't, even, even if, you know, if this gentleman, if this couple sells it to someone, that that person could still be approached with the same thing. But, you know, what, what, what um, the current seller, what he really brought home to me and we stress this over and over again, is that it's dark for, for him right now as to what it would look like from that home site, the work that the town does, and what extent it would be uh, the effect of removing trees or removing a sense of privacy. Because the big draw for that property is its sense of privacy, even though it's right in the middle of town. Um, so, yeah, you know, and-, and, and Well, we, if, the town, if the town owned it, it wouldn't matter. And if somebody else owned it, you know, then we could talk to them about it if, if that occurred. Uh, you know, I don't think they're going to lose privacy by what the town is proposing. It's mostly taking down that a big berm that forces the river tightly right around that corner. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, and, yeah, and I Phil, guess, Phil showed me. It, there, there, you know, it would involve taking down some trees, and, and that would that would um, open up the, 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 the woods a little bit uh, for the uh, house that's across the street. Uh, Maple Street on top, is that Maple? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, the top of that is Bond Street. Right, right, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, so the house that's there would, would be opened up a little bit. They'll grow back. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm surprised that, that there really is that much interest in that property because it just seems like given its proximity to the river that as far as having that be a building lot for someone to, you know, purchase and put a new house on that, that, I mean, I don't know so much about like, you know, the building codes and the conservation commission, but I'm just, I'm surprised that, that there's that much interest in that property, frankly. Well, it, it is a small septic and it's the septic is from what the seller says is just rated for one bedroom. Um, and you can't get financing from banks or mortgages for a one bedroom house. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or if you can, it's more difficult, whatever. Um, and, and so, so that's part, and, and, you know, he, so, uh, um, that, that's part of it, but somebody would need to build a house there. <laughs> um, and, and if it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to put a one bedroom thing in there, I, I don't know. Yeah, I just heard it burned. The, the owner came to the Conservation Commission and talked about his hope to put to rebuild a house on that same footprint, but didn't have a project. Um, but he, he just wanted to get permission from the Conservation Commission to come in with heavy equipment and tear, you know, the, the burned wreckage out. And, and was going to come back to the Conservation Commission at some point to, to seek, uh, you know, an RDA or an NOI or whatever it would yeah. be. Yeah. 
No, and um, he, it, 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 the estimates that he got were far in excess of what he thought they would be and what he was prepared to spend on it. Um, and he just, they, they want to get out of sort of the development part of it and they're get, they want to travel more and do stuff. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, I, but, I, honestly, I feel like $1,300 is, is a pretty small chunk of change. And that it, to me, it seems like that property is always going to be more valuable to the town than to a private citizen as far as a development lot. Tom, Tom, is there any word as to whether the 1300 can come from the purchase of real estate fund? Um, I haven't heard uh, specifically about that. I'm a lot more optimistic about the 1300. Um, th there may be no laws. Well, what I have not yet gotten the chance to do is look up the minutes from the town meeting where that, um, where the, where the grammar school was sold in order to see whether or not there were restrictions on, on that. But certainly an appraisal is part of buying a piece of land. So I, I would not expect there to be anything in that, that that restricted the town from that. All right. All right. So I'm going to make a motion that we uh, sign the contract for $1,300 to do the appraisal with Kitchell and Lee. Second that. All in favor? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Uh, so it's unanimous. Um, now, Tom, the other piece in here had to do with funding for the 21E. Is that something, it didn't seem like that was anything we need to, to vote on. Is this just information? Yes, and I have not yet heard back from DOR, uh, as I just mentioned. Um, uh, again, the, the more I look into it, the, unless there's a town meeting restriction on that, on that money, um, I, do, I don't, I haven't found anything in the Mass General Laws about it. There's a there's a book that, that is just on finance and and uh, taxation law, and and it it's very well indexed. And I did not see anything in there on that. What, what there are are restrictions on on um, land that the town gets through foreclosures, and that wasn't the case here. So um, it, it's quite conceivable that that money should actually have gone to the general fund. Uh, but it didn't, and here we are. So um, that's that's where we stand. I, I've I've uh, called the guy. I've, uh, I've I've emailed him multiple times. Um, nothing yet. That's our that's our local um, Department of Revenue field representative. You know, and if I um, if I ask town council, that's who he'd call. If I ask Jan, that's who she'd call. Right, Jan? Dave Guzman. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm I'm still just waiting for a, an answer from him. Yeah, you know, Dave's predecessor, Dave's predecessor used to telephone the new uh, uh, select men, select board members as they came on and introduce himself themselves. Oh. Do you know that? Dave's slacking off. You know, the, well, they also used to have a lot more staff members. Uh, Baker has cut um, the DOR field staff substantially. I thought nothing happens during COVID time anyway, but try to deal with the, the you know, Department of uh, Motor Vehicles these days. Okay, new business. Uh, so Tom sent us a copy of the handbook policy dealing with Family Medical Leave Act. And apparently um, Jan is looking for, uh, for us to come to a decision of what we're going to do or, or, or to, and uh, do you want to, do you want to address this, Jan? Sure. So we just came upon a little section of the, of the employee handbook that uh, leaves it a little open for interpretation. I don't know uh, if you have the section highlighted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I sent that. Okay. Yeah. So there's a little uh, part in there that says that you, uh, the town may recover the cost of any payments made to maintain your health insurance cover coverage unless the failure to return to work was for reasons beyond your control. So um, 
you know, without discussing any particulars here, because we can't do that at this time, I'm just uh, looking for some clarification and under what circumstances would the town ask an employee that was on FMLA leave to pay it back? And then uh, furthermore, um, you may have somebody that doesn't return from FMLA leave, but gets an extended non-FMLA leave. And at the end of that leave, would they be asked to pay it back? Or So I'm looking for some clarification here. Any thoughts? Yeah. Any thoughts? And um, Jan, I, I did I did forward one I, I, I did sort of lay out that um, those issues and uh, suggested that um, that the board might interpret the the phrase upon the complete or or might either interpret or rewrite upon the completion of your FMLA leave as upon the completion of your FMA FMLA leave and any other subsequently approved leave. And, and the, the key there for me is that if somebody needs to take extra time, um, you know, FMLA is, is a little generous. Um, there is, you know, some new Massachusetts uh, leave um, going beyond FMLA. Um, and it, it could be that, that somebody just needs more time than they can get through FMLA, um, but they still intend to continue. So, so for me, the reason the, the board would go after somebody is if they took the leave in bad faith and were never intending to come back. Um, and, and that was somehow made evident. But somebody who in good faith is saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I definitely intend to come back. Um, and then even if they just need a little extra leave, I think it's okay to still, you know, not go after them for, for paying back. If they leave for good, I think that's when the board should consider um, trying to claw back the, the, the benefits we paid. So, so I, I, I did lay that out for the board briefly. I, I guess my question here is, is how you can interpret, like how do we judge intent? I mean, if someone takes, FMLA leave, they need additional leave, and they don't wind up coming back, how do we determine that they never intended to come back? And how do we determine that we then need to recoup the money that we spent on their insurance? Yeah, well, that I, I think that's one of the reasons that it should remain as it is now on a case-by-case -case basis. The, the, the board has the flexibility to go after them, but, is, but it's, not a, uh, it's not a mandated thing. It, the board may do this. But Jan, are you looking for examples? I mean, you said, could we, could we think of reasons? Uh, uh, um, I, I don't want to uh, put in any specific examples. I guess what I'm looking for, number one, is, you know, um, I, I want to make sure that you agree with me, but I don't believe that this would be something that would be up to my discretion. You know, when this, if this comes up, then, you know, I don't think I should be the one to decide this, and I hope you agree with that. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so examples, no, I'm not looking for examples. I really like, I like Tom's wording that he's suggesting about the, um, you know, if you have an approved extended leave, because certainly there could be circumstances that um, require, require somebody to be out for longer than what the FMLA leave would allow for. So, you know, the approved leave that's that's where your discretion comes in you know are you going to approve a further leave or, or not and uh and if you're not and you don't return to work then then comes a decision of whether you have to pay it back or not so it's kind of two steps there and i assume that both of them whether the leave is approved you know by the town or whether it's approved under fmla we're talking about the insurance expenditure. Yes. So yeah, we're talking about insurance. So the town has to pay its portion throughout an FMLA leave. But after that, it does not. So we're yes, we're talking about insurance costs. So for the approved leave, the town would not pay for, pay for the insurance? Uh, the town does not have to, no. And we can still make that decision on a case by case basis. So someone could take FMLA leave 
and then say, I actually need another two months. And we could say, fine, come back to your job, but we're not going to cover your insurance for those two months. We could, yes. Okay. It's not what? Really cover insurance for just a leave. In fact, um, I can't think of any circumstance where we have covered insurance while they're on just, just a leave of absence. FMLA is different. Wasn't there a COVID extension, FMLA extension? If FMLA is, is used up, isn't there an additional extension now that was passed? I don't know. No. Um, it's still not unlimited, but that, that's, that's my recollection of the way uh, of, because Frontier had to redo their policy recently on this for that reason. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it did. It, I think it allowed for some longer periods of time for um, reasons like childcare. I think that one was extended. Right. And, and, and so, so one of the things too that you have to, the, the considerations of this is that employees in general, if an employee is in a classification uh, in their life, that, that an FMLA, that they would be eligible for an FMLA leave. Um, you, it's, it's in the town's best interest that they stay at work and not take that leave. And um, so, so, I mean, all, all things being equal, they, you know, you want your employees like at work um, instead of not at work. And, and the, the uh, um, and that's like a, a really good argument for making arrangements or accommodations for COVID and for other, for, for other things as well that, um, you know, b because FMLA leave costs the, you know, the town doesn't have that a, a worker and the town's paying for a worker. Um, um, so. Yeah, your costs increase for sure. But like if you took an example and I, I hesitate to go for examples, but say um, somebody took an FMLA leave to take care of a, a very sick spouse and the spouse died and um, they got left enough money that they didn't have to work anymore. So they decided not to come back to work. Would, would you, would you want to have that employee pay back the health insurance? You know, so there's, I don't know. Or, I mean, bad another, no. I, mean I, I think another example is you had an employee who had to take care of a very sick spouse and the spouse didn't die and they exhausted their FMLA leave and they had to leave their job because they had to take care of the spouse. Would we want to call a that? Better, yes, a better at, example. At that point. <laughs> yeah, so. so. So we should be prepared to make that decision, you know, at the time that we have to make that decision as opposed to think about yes. it now. Um, but, but so I, I really would encourage you to think about Tom's uh, language that he liked for our policy book. Well, and the language today is that the town may recover it. And that's it is, yep. it. it's yep. not a change. So that's not yeah. a change, correct. Uh, to to yeah, me, I mean, it feels like if an employee takes a leave and then they get permission to, to take extended leave, that's kind of granting them approval for the town paying their insurance. No, uh, no, not going forward. Yeah, the town would pay the insurance during the extended leave. No, not during no. the extended period, but, but, but they're not, they're then, that's, that would be an improved reason for not coming back to work. You know, we wouldn't say, oh, you didn't come back to work at the end of your FMLA, so we, we're going to claw back your insurance, uh, contri our insurance contribution. Because we've granted them permission to continue their leave. Yeah. I see your point. But, yeah. But but if at the end of the FMLA you see their Instagram that shows that they opened a bar on the Turks and Caicos, you know, <laughs> then, then, then maybe you would do something about it. Right. Um, I mean, I, I, I fully support making the decision on a case by case basis. I'm I'm just wondering if. I, I don't I mean, is that extra language necessary? Um, no. I mean, I guess, I guess it, it doesn't have it. It doesn't, you know, it, like to me, it doesn't seem like it makes that much of a difference to include and any other subsequently approved leave. Oh, we, we, we could add that. That would be easy enough. Okay. So if we're going to do by case by case basis, at what point do I come to the select board to ask about this? 
I personally, I would say as soon as someone um, completes their FMLA leave and then requests to take additional leave. I'd, I'd that's, the end of their additional leave. Uh, in well, other no, words, if, they, if they complete their FMLA leave and then they say, well, actually, I'm, I need another two months, I think that would be the point at which... But, and it's, if it's not granted, then, then you would come to us. A... Right. I, okay. Yeah, you're right. So at the end of their approved leave. Okay. And, and you know, I, I saw that in Tom's, in Tom's notes or his analysis to us or whatever, I don't know what, what the label of it is, that, that um, Tom had, made, had said that the only argument against maintaining flexibility that I can see is that the decision made will be treated as a precedent which should be followed. So, uh, you know, to, to, um, to that end, I would just say, put a sentence in there saying, um, this should not create a bond binding precedent on the select board from in the future or something like that. So. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'm not sure if it, it just kind of legally does anyway. Um, no, but people that wouldn't stop people from saying, well, they got it. Why can't I? Right. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I would think that all of these questions are fairly well settled by now because these have been litigated up the wazoo by all of our big unions and all of our big companies in the state. Um, this is, um, you know, this was wielded. This is now wielded against management in contract negotiations all across the state and many different industries. Um, well, that's that's the management point of view, of course. Or, Jan, the alternative is we could write your name right into the handbook and say this decision should always be made by Jan. So, so no, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, what if what if you have an employee who's um, weighing whether they return to work or not, whether um, whether they have to pay this back? They would be that's returning true. under duress. So uh, an employee who only returns because the alternative is they have to pay back their health insurance? Yeah. I mean, you're, it's a significant amount. I hope that we oh, so they could return and then for a few weeks and then quit. No, the law says they have to return. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was more than a week or two. It, it was like a month or something. Um, so the law doesn't allow them to come back for a, a day or two and maintain their benefits. Um, so, so that's covered. But, but what if, you know, they're, they're looking to um, extend their leave, but they, they might not if they had to, you know, pay back that health insurance. No, but if, if they get permission to extend their leave, they wouldn't have to pay back the health insurance. Okay. So that's what you're saying. If, if well, basically. What, yeah. It's all about the approval. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you, we don't want, we don't want, you know, we want empl voluntary employees, not right. hostage employees. Right. I mean, well, oh, but that's what health, that's what healthcare is all about. You know, people who are stuck in a job only because of the health care. Anyway. Yeah, so then really what it still comes back to is I need the policy to say that if you do not return to work at the completion of your FMLA or other approved leave, the town may recover, blah, blah, blah. It, it kind of comes back to that. We could state it that way. Yeah. Yeah. If if, yeah, if, I, if it's in the town's discretion to make that decision, then the policy should state that, and that that. Sure, I'll um I'll have something uh, formal, and okay. I'll notify the uh, personnel committee. Great. Great. Um, so we're not going to vote on anything, but it was a good, you know. It's, yeah, it's, I'll I'll have something formal ready. for you next time. Great. Uh, is, is time of the essence on this policy, Jan? Is any, does anybody uh, know? Yes. Well, I think, I think next week will be fine from what I've heard. It's two weeks. 
It's two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Well, but you could you could let whoever is dealing with this know what the town is going to put in the personnel, you know, the way that we feel about it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Has this, has this been helpful? Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, we have a, a grant agreement over to accept $3,500 in recycling funds for from the DEP. Yeah, sure. So, well, all we have to do is sign a form. Should have been more. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to make up for the cost of recycling right now, that's for sure. It, it, it would be more if we charged more for different bulky waste items. That's an easy two points, but we don't do it. So, And, and put them up on our web. We've only got like two things out of six. Mm. Did we talk to the Board of Health about this? Yeah, they know. Future discussion. So, uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to make a motion that we sign the DEP grant to uh, accept $3,500. Yes, I, yeah. yes. Okay, I see a second sure. and unanimous. That was interesting but, reading. I did not know of the whole scorecard concept, or I didn't remember it from previous years. I got to run up the score more. So we have two licenses for the Conway Inn. Uh, and uh, which uh, which which Tom has, and we need to go to town hall to sign. So yes, the um, the the um, and that also goes for the warrants. I'll remind you. Uh, well, a actually, Bob's signature is the only one needed on that DEP contract, but everybody does need to sign the licenses. Uh, I'll note that the motion should be. Um, uh, upon receipt of payment um, because the the second item here um, no it's the first it's the first item um, uh, consider possible reduction in fees we actually don't have a fee on it yet so we have not been able to receive payment and theoretically you can't approve the uh, license until we've received the payment so uh, upon receipt of payment would be, would be good to append to a motion to approve. What did we do about this last year? Did, didn't we charged her the full amount. And what is that amount? It's $500 for the liquor license. And there's a, um, there's a Vic Tueller's license as well. I think that's 25. And I, I believe theoretically there's also a jukebox license. <laughs> Yeah. I thought that we returned some of the money or something last year uh, to the Congress. I don't recall oh. that. Oh, okay. Well, yes, I. We may have talked I, about it. I, I think $500 is a lot of money. Uh, should we cut it in half? I'm. Totally support that. I know that Barb has lost a lot of business this past these past several Absolutely. Months. I think half would be a good amount. Okay. You, you know, I don't know if we need to cut the twenty-five dollar one in half. We could cut them all in half, though. But uh, I mean, the Conway Inn is precious to all of us, and and uh, and you know. It's not like Barb is, you know, socking it away. You know, um, yeah, we, we want her to keep going. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would support cutting in half whatever the total she paid last year for jukebox and um, everything. So is that a motion? Yep. I'll second it. <laughs> Phil seconded it. Okay. All in okay. favor. So I think we're all in favor. Yep. Great. So that's approved all applicable licenses with the fees cut in half. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. 
Uh, Tom sent us an Excel spreadsheet of the uh, select board budgets and then a little explanation of why they're a little more interesting than they might normally be. Um, you know, that John had volunteered to forego his stipend and that means we didn't budget enough money um, unless somebody else is willing to forego their stipend. So is that right, Tom? I mean, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, the current year's budget is pretty much one normal select board stipend. Um, mostly this has to do with the, the next, um, well, there's, there's uh, yeah, this first part is about this year's stipends. So the question is, um, there is a certain amount of money in there, and uh, soon um, you all will be asked to sign stipend approval forms for everybody that get paid out at the end of the year. Um, and as I recall, um, last year, John O'Rourke and Bob Armstrong both volunteered to give up their stipends to help with what seemed to be an impending revenue uh, collapse, uh, which so far, thankfully, we haven't uh, seen anywhere uh, near what we were fearing. Um, but again, that leaves this year um, uh, underfunded. And uh, I just thought I would note that. And so um, uh, it, it, it is awkward because, of course, Erica wasn't here to um, make a decision at that point. So I just leave it up to your discussion. Um, we can just go forward as was originally envisioned, or there might be some uh, rejiggering that goes on. For next year, it feels to me like we all have just signed up to get our stipends and we can voluntarily turn them back if we want. But then, then at least- Okay, okay, this isn't, yeah, we're, let's talk about this. Next year, I, I have more to talk about. So in the second item, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I, you know, I, I think that this is like pretty embarrassing, um, and I think it's embarrassing for well, I, I don't know how embarrassing it is for Eric. Eric is not easily embarrassed. Not embarrassed. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, but 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 the thing about this is that when this happened, uh, you know, t Tom, I I I I I made sure to have it when John first announced that he was doing this. I took Tom, we had a private conversation where I said that this is not really John's to do. And that I, I remember also saying to you that John's not likely to win his reelection. And that, um, you know, that, that, that this is just, you know, not his to do that, that you're doing this to the person that takes his spot. Um, oh, and, you said that in open meeting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah. remember. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, that so so I don't know how then it ended up still being um, because I remember you agreeing with that. And I, so I don't know how it still ended up going through. Um, well, it is the select board's budget and uh, things are different now. That's all I'll say. Well, com just being like taking myself completely out of the equation. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's a very, you know, it's a small, I like, I don't think anyone like runs for select board for the money. No. Um, but I think that like in general, I, I think it, it does sort of incentivize the participation in local government. So I support in general select board, um, membership being compensated. Um, but Tom, as you said, this is a completely different time. I'm like, you know, the newbie here on the committee, if this is something that, you know, um, you all decided to do, I'm totally willing to forego, you know, a stipend because this is something that came before me, but I just, but it wasn't something that we all decided to do. It was something that yeah. John decided to do. Okay. And uh, decided not to do or well or not, but he, that was a decision. It was, and, and, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's not complicated to come up with the money and pay the stipend now that John's no longer on the committee. And so Tom, are you looking for a direction from the board? to do that? Uh, one possibility would be to request from the finance committee um, money that was not budgeted 
um, due to uh, unexpected circumstances. Yeah. I think we should do that. Yeah. Can I abstain? I feel like I should abstain because... <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I mean, although differently, like next, you know, for, for, for the 2022 budget. Um, well, I mean, you know, we're going to have to talk about this again or, and um, when we get, when we get to the next item on the agenda, <laughs> which will be what to do for next year. Okay. But, but for this year, I think we should ask the, the finance committee for a few measly dollars. You know, it's not, it isn't that much money. Can I still abstain? And, and that's uh, I have a vote. I, like I just I, I don't know. I mean, like you said, it's like I I just don't feel comfortable. So like, Phil, would you, if I make a, a a motion that we that we ask the finance committee for to to make up for John stipend? Yes, you, I'll second. You would second that, and yeah. then I'll vote in favor, and you will, and so yeah. you don't have to vote at all. You can okay. abstain. Right. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Great. Now, how about for next year? For next year, I support, I mean, it's, it's, it looks like this is what it's been for the past several years. So I would support, um, yeah, I'll, I'll move that we have stipends of 1800 what is it, $1,800? Yep. And, and that they not be, that they would only be voluntarily not accepted at the time that they're offered or something like that, right? Uh, that that somebody well in advance of, of of their being offered people shouldn't turn them down i yeah i mean maybe i had to sign paperwork when i was elected so maybe at the time that you know you sign your paperwork and i mean even if you take the money if you don't want it you can still donate it to you know the right. Festival Hill Scholarship Committee. You know, I mean, you can give it, right. in ways you can give it back to the town. There are, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I personally think that it, it should be increased to at least two thousand annually, um, a two hundred dollar only because when when we you know when when we because we 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 sign off on everybody's stipend, and when I see that we pay the animal control officer, um, or you know what. We should we should we shouldn't pay the animal control officer more than the select board members. That's that's just all. We the dog has you know. We should, uh, let's I, not do it next year. Yeah, I um, think next year is going to be a bad. Year. Uh, I know, I know. Um, it's yeah, yeah. But yes, for for those of you watching at home, it is more lucrative to be Conway's dog catcher than it is to be Conway's select board member. Just so you know. Stipends are notoriously problematic. They're historically yeah. set. Yeah. All kinds of differentiations are there. And and comparing one to another is is uh, dangerous yeah. ground. I'm just yeah. just just your <laughs> yeah, heads true. up there. I, I did have I did have one other piece on here, which is that especially since this um appraisal thing has come up now, um I think that the select board should consider a couple of thousand dollars for general expenses um, because things have come up in the past as well. The select board says, oh, get this, do that. And it's not in the select board's budget. It's, it comes from my budget, which is, you know, I think about it when I put it together. So when there's more things to come in, if the select board wants some money to, you know, be able to do things like this. I think putting a couple thousand dollars in for general expenses is not too much. Yeah, I agree. So I'll, uh, I, I will, I will do that, and you'll of course have the chance to explore that and other, um, all the other items that you want to during the budget process. Yeah, and you had that two thousand dollars in the Excel spreadsheet you sent us. Tricky, aren't I? <laughs> okay, how about items not anticipated in 48 hours in advance of the meeting? Um, uh, let's see. Got complaint. Got got complaints about the sound quality and the uh, of the videos that we of the select board the past two meetings. They said that there's been terrible echoes and it's very difficult to listen from home. 
You can't make out what people are saying. The interest yeah, that was that, that was because of the uh, the conference call. Uh, I, I think it was a, an effect of, of the conference call in the room, especially. I went back and listened to that video myself, and, and it was very difficult to hear uh, the uh, people who came in on the conference call. Is there a way to more directly connect the conference call to the, to the camera? I mean, because we oh, you can use those two. Or the, you'd have to ask someone from FCAT about that, uh, Bob. I will, I will try to do that. And then um, so, some, someone else approached about the, uh, in the forest stewardship, in Mary Wigmore's forest stewardship plan. I don't know how well you've studied it, but in, her, in the town forest part of it, um, she recommended establishing an overlook on a certain, uh, you know, sort of an end of the trail overlook on, on a, on, in stand number one on the east, the easternmost, whatever thing on stick and it she says it with with, uh, with with a million dollar view unbroken woods often the, uh, you're above the canopy you see unbroken woods and mountains all the way in the distance but um uh multiple people have don't know where exactly she was talking about so if there's people that know exactly where she's talking about whatever i i actually went in and took a look at the report today and went out there uh and I couldn't really find it. So, um, and I know the area well, so. Say, do you happen to have a copy of that report on you? Say, I do. Ah, I'm gonna write, please do not remove on the oh. on it when you bring it back. I meant, to bring, those, it, I, meant to, I meant to bring it back before you got back. It'll, it'll be there tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah, those those are the only two hard copies we, we got from the consultant, so. Uh, no, but I. I thank you. It's hard enough to find it without memory. I mean, um, mem could, you, could you write Mary a note about that if people are wondering and we could talk about it in town meeting? I mean, in, a, in select board meeting? Sure. Uh, sure. You know, I'm sure she could show us on a map or something right where she's talking about. Great. How about an update, Tom? Okay, just writing down my uh, little task there. Um, in committee news, uh, there have been two recent resignations. <clears throat> Marie Eichen from the Board of Health for oh. personal reasons, and uh, Dave Barton from the Personnel Committee as his wife's health is declining. Oh. And also the, uh, the Finance Committee appointed Steve Dinkelacker as its representative to the Personnel Committee, so that committee still has a quorum. Uh, in other committee news, the Cultural Council grant application deadline is November 16th. So get those Cultural Council grant applications in. I'm thinking of uh, TikTok videos myself. So, um, Have we had these in the past? You know, do, could you, can you reflect on what people have written in the past? Oh, there's there's all kinds of of cultural council things that that, that they fund. Uh, we don't get a lot of money, um, but it's gone for musical events and and art um, art events at the library, I think. And um, I poetry. think maybe poetry. yeah, poetry, writing, graphic arts. Yeah, dancing. There, there's dancing. a group. dancing. Oh, cool! Variety of things. Um, in departmental news, the fiscal year 22 budget worksheets went out as planned and a number have already been returned. A good start to the, to the budget year. I think I copied you all on, on that uh, original email. So, you know, it's the beginning of budget season. Um, the amount of money in the sale of real estate account, which Phil mentioned last week and this week, Oh, last time and, and this time, uh, is about $84,995 at this moment. Um, since the site has an industrial past, including a tannery, uh, as you know, the town should have an environmental assessment done. A phase one environmental site assessment typically costs between four and $6,000. 
that involves a site visit and historical review. That would not include soil and groundwater testing, which would be a phase two environmental assessment in case it was recommended after phase one and presumably more expensive. So th th those are the numbers we're talking about. So these are what we would have to perform on the, on the property across the river. Yeah, to, to do our due diligence, to know that we weren't uh, inheriting a toxic waste dump. The, it's actually a, it's a chapter 21E is the Massachusetts Superfund law. And uh, the, these laws have to do with who the responsible party is. So if we, um, if we buy the property, we become the responsible party for cleaning it up if there's anything on it. So that's something we don't want to do if there's, you know, a large amount of money anticipated and needed for spend up, for, for, uh, for cleanup. Yeah. Um, the, the FERCOG has had Brownfields money in the past and they will in the future, but all of their current grant, this is the very end of their, their grant cycle. So all the money is currently, um, uh, allocated, but I am sending a letter in, uh, has to be in by Friday to, uh, formally request, <coughs> excuse me, being put on a waiting list. Well, what, what, when's the next grant cycle start? Uh, no, it, 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 this would be for basically fiscal year 22. So not, not until probably a year from now. Um, <clears throat> in other news, uh, at the request of a resident who had trouble finding the hours for early voting, I purchased two sign boards, one for the town office and one for the town hall. They will be of use for town meetings, future elections, bill due dates, and general information. Some of you may have seen the early voting sign up. Uh, by the town office. Uh, also in response to concerns uh, expressed, uh, we've changed the calendar on the website to be immediate, immediately accessible on the front page without having to click on the calendar menu item. There are additional grants available for businesses affected by COVID-19, these including a program for businesses employing fewer than 50 people as well as micro enterprise grants. That's what I mentioned before that uh, if you employ five or fewer people. So now there's 50 or fewer. Uh, information on those is posted on the website. <clears throat> we have a second student at Smith Agricultural and Technical High School. That means the tech school budget is off considerably about 17,000 for tuition and 17,000 for transportation. Since there's only 40,000 in the reserve fund, my suggestion is to take it from free cash at the next town meeting. I've also let Alan Singer, the finance committee chair, know. Students often don't indicate interest until mid-March and it's not till April that they usually sign up. Uh, that means I don't get into, into my preliminary budget, um, but it can, if we know by then, it can get into the uh, budget voted by town meeting. Uh, this year, we really didn't know till school started. I have never added hypothetical students in my preliminary budget. That would add an extra $34,000 to taxes just in case someone signs up. But it is awkward when someone does. Uh, the Massachusetts House Ways and Means budget dropped on Friday. Conway gained $16 for the library. <laughs> Debate starts tomorrow. The Mass Municipal Association has laid out its priorities for the 777 amendments filed. Let me know if you would like their email on that for yeah, advocacy it. purposes. Yeah, okay. I will. I'll, 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 I'll send it around. Um, and finally, I have applied for a Maya risk management grant for Conway's contribution to an ultraviolet disinfectant system for Frontier, as well as a work zone safety trailer with equipment. One of the things we lacked in the windstorm was enough road closed and detour signs and traffic cones to cope with all of the 
roads that were closed and detours that were needed and branches flying across the road. So with any luck, we will get that and be better equipped. And that's it for me, for now. Any mail? Uh, hang on, actually, let me look. Uh, we got an update from the housing, the Franklin County Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Um, the current regional grant, um, which is a multi-year grant, which we entered into with three other towns, uh, is coming to a close on December 31st. Uh, we're in with Deerfield, Sunderland, and Leverett. And uh, we've had um, nine units rehabilitated. Uh, Deerfield had 11, so we're, we're number two in the number of units we actually got, uh, got assistance for here. And uh, they've spent, uh, th for all the four towns, about $920,000. So it's a, it's a major um, program. It comes under the Community Development Block Grant. And um, uh, they always send us their report. And uh, now they're saying that uh, things are wrapping up for this and that there will be no further extensions to the grant activities. Uh, I don't know if anything's coming up in the future, but I'm sure they'll let us know when it's time to, uh, to reapply. That's the only piece of mail. Great. Any announcements? Okay. Next meeting. So I would still, I mean, I, I, I much prefer these having them by Zoom rather than having them with masks and conference call. Uh, and. The audio is probably better for the public, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, every day, the, the COVID numbers get worse and worse. And Baker has released really significantly stricter rules. Um, I don't know that we need to talk about them in select board meetings, but, you know, they're being promoted everywhere. And, and they're actually saying they're going to really enforce them this time. Uh, we'll see, but you know, if you're found not wearing a mask, you can be fined $300. The irony is I just got an email from my kid's school saying that they're getting pressure from the, um, from the Department of Education to bring kids back to in-person learning. They are. <laughs> Governor Baker the that they're, you is know, changing the uh, the rules under which which towns are highly pressured and yeah. towns like Conway or, or, or regions like the, or like our region. You know, the, they established scientific guidelines for reopening. And um, if you say, you know, it, it's not the governor that did that. It was the scientific community in the state that did that. So I, I think we're still... You know, if, and if they say that, you know, in your community is such that you should be doing at least a hybrid plan, then you should be doing at least a hybrid plan. I, I'm, all other things being equal, we ought not to substitute our own judgment for those of our health professionals. And we are. <laughs> yeah. We're doing good. We're doing good. Frontier still hasn't had a case. Conway Grammar still hasn't had a case. So our next meeting, two weeks, by Zoom? Sounds good. Yep. Okay. Okay, Robert. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll take the heat. I don't mind. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Yep. <laughs> thank you all. So I make a motion that we, we adjourn. Second. Second, I, unanimous. Thank you very yep. much, Tom. All right. Thank you. Thank you.